Hi everyone, welcome to this series of supply chain lectures. I'm Johannes Vermorel and today I will be presenting um, a few quantitative principles for supply chain. For those of you who are watching the lecture live on YouTube, you can ask your question at any point of time via the YouTube chat. Um, however, I will not be reading uh, your question during the lectures. I will be coming back uh, to the chat at the end of the lecture and do my best to answer at least most of the questions. So quantitative uh, principles are of high interest because um, in supply chains, as we have seen, supply chains as, as we have seen during the first lectures, um, the mastery of optionality and most of those options are quantitative in nature. You can uh, decide, you have to decide how much you buy, how much you produce, how much uh, inventory you move, and potentially the, the price point, whether you want it to move, to move the price point up or down. So uh, quantitative principle that can you know, drive improving the numerical recipes that you have for supply chain are of high interest. However, if I were to ask you know, most um, uh, supply chain authorities, supply chain experts nowadays, what are your quantitative, your core quantitative principles for supply chains? I suspect that, um, that frequently I would get an answer along the, uh, I would say along the lines of um, a series of techniques for better time series forecasting or something, something equivalent. And my personal reaction is that although it's, it's interesting and relevant, it's also missing the point. Uh, and, uh, and I believe at the core, the misunderstanding lies in the very nature of progress itself. How do you, what is progress and, and how can you actually, you know, implement something like progress as far as supply chain is concerned. So let me start with an illustrating example. 6,000 years ago, uh, the wheel was invented. And 6,000 years later or so, um, the, suit, the, the, the wheeled suitcase was invented. So by that time, um, the, the invention is dated from uh, 1949, as illustrated by, by, by this patent. And, um, and by the time the, the wheeled suitcase was invented, um, uh, we had already harnessed you know, the atomic power and even detonated the first few atomic bombs. Fast forward uh, 20 years later, in uh, 1969, mankind sent the first people on the moon. And then, uh, in this order, uh, the next year, the, uh, the, the, the wheel suitcase is improved with a, a slightly better handle, uh, which looks like a, a leash, as illustrated by, by this patent. It's still not very good. And then, so 20 years later again, uh, you know, by that time, uh, we already have, you know, um, uh, the, the GPS, Global Positioning System, that is, you know, in production and that has, that has even been serving civilian for almost a decade. And, and then uh, the, the proper handle for the wheel suitcase is, is finally invented. And so there are, I, I believe, at least two lessons of, of interest here. First, there is no such thing as um, an obvious, you know, arrow of time as far as progress is concerned. Progress happens in a highly chaotic, nonlinear manner, and it's, it's very, very hard to assess, you know, the progress that, that should happen, you know, in one field based on what is happening on other fields. So that would be one element that we need to keep in mind today. And the second thing is that uh, progress should not be confused with uh, sophistication. You can have something that is you know, vastly superior, but also vastly simpler. And, and if I take the example of, of this suitcase, um, once you've seen one, the design looks completely obvious, self-evident. But was it an easy problem to solve? Um, I would say absolutely not. I mean, the proof, the, sim the simple proof that it was actually a very tough nut to crack is that for a fairly advanced um, uh, industrial civilization, it took almost, you know, uh, it took something a bit more than, than, than four decades to solve this problem. Um, so, uh, so again, there is a, the end. So sophistication can be, you know, deceptive. Progress is deceptive in the sense that it doesn't abide by the rule of sophistication, that there is, again, it's very hard to identify uh, what was the word like before progress happened, because it's literally, as it happens, 
changing your view of the world. So now back, uh, back to our supply chain stories. So this is the sixth and last lecture in this, uh, in this prologue. And so there is a, a big plan that you can check online on, on the Lockout website about uh, the whole plan for all those series of supply chain lectures. And so um, two weeks ago, I was presenting uh, the 20th century trends for supply chains, and I was basically adopting a purely uh, qualitative perspective to, uh, on, on the problem. And today, I'm doing pretty much the, the opposite on adopting a, a fairly quantitative perspectives on this set of problems as a counterpoint. And so, let's proceed. Um, so today, we will be reviewing a set of, of principles. Again, what do I mean by principle? As things, things that, can be, you know, that, that can be used to improve um, the design of numerical recipes in general for, for all the supply chains that you can think of. So we have, we have an ambition of generalization here. And that's, that's the trick. That's where it's, it's quite difficult is to find things that are you know, of prime relevance for all supply chains, for all the numerical methods that you could think, uh, that you could think of in order to improve supply chains. And we will review two, two, two short lists of principles the first one will be observational principles, so um, principles that apply in the way you can gain knowledge and information, quantitatively speaking, about supply chains. And the second series of principles will be optimization principles that relate about how do you act once you've you know, acquired knowledge, quantitative knowledge about your supply chain, how do you act, and, and more specifically, once you, you embrace this um, quantitative perspective, how do you use this, these things to basically improve your optimization processes themselves. Okay, so let's get started. Let's about you know observing a supply chain. One thing that is very puzzling to me when, when people speak about supply chains is that they speak as, uh, of supply chains as if you could observe supply chains directly, you know, with your own eyes. And and for me, this is this is a very distorted perception about the reality of supply chain. Um, Supply chains cannot be humanly observed directly. I mean, not at least not in a, in a quantitative perspective. Why is that? Because supply chain by design, I mean, it, it's something that is a construct that is uh, geographically distributed. It involves potentially thousands of SKUs, uh, potentially tens of thousands of, of units. And, and, you, and at best, with your human eyes, you could only observe the supply chain as it is today and not how it was in, in the past. And you can't remember, you know, more than maybe a few, uh, a few numbers or a tiny fraction of the numbers that, that are associated with your supply chain. So whenever you want to observe a supply chain, you're going to, do, uh, you're, you're going to perform those observations indirectly via enterprise software. And that's a very, very specific way to look at supply chain. So all the observations that can be made, quantitatively speaking, about the supply chain happen via this very specific medium, which is enterprise software. So let's, let's characterize a bit uh, a typical piece of enterprise software. A typical piece of enterprise software is going to be something that is typically going to contain a database. I mean, the vast, vast majority of those software are designed that way. And um, they are going, the, the piece of software is going to contain something like 500, and that's the entry point, you know, 500 tables, 10,000 fields. A field is basically a column in a table, if you want. It's a, a, the technical word for it. So, so what we have is, as an entry point, we have you know, a, a system that potentially contain, con contains you know, a massive amount of information. But the reality is that uh, for, in most situations, only a, a tiny fraction of all this software complexity is, uh, is actually relevant for the supply chain of interest. You see, that the thing. Um, software vendors design uh, enterprise pieces of software taking into account, you know, very diverse situations uh, uh, across the board. So when you look at one specific client, odds are that only a tiny fraction of the capabilities of the software are actually used, which means that while you have maybe 10,000 fields to explore in theory, the reality is that in the companies, they are only using a tiny fraction of all those fields. Now, how do you sort it out? And that's, that's, again, that's a very important question because we want to observe supply chain. We, we, the only, we can only observe the supply chains via this you know, 
enterprise software, and usually there is m much more than one, you can have an entire applicative landscape in front of you. And how do you sort out you know, the information that is relevant from the one where it's, it's, it's not even that it's not relevant, it's that usually it's not even, it's non-existent. So you have the trivial situation where you look at a column, you know, at a field, and this field has never been used, so the data is constant. It's only you know, zeros or nulls all the way down. In this sort of situation, it's trivial. You can literally eliminate uh, the field because it doesn't contain any information. But in practice, the amount of fields that you can eliminate through this method, it may be 10% or so. You know, uh, as a ballpark estimate, uh, in our experience, it's, it's maybe 10% of the fields that have absolutely constant value, not really much more. Why? Because pretty much all the features in a piece of software have been used over the years potentially, if only accidentally. So you see, the column is not constant because somebody years ago tested the features, just entered some dummy data, and never went back. So if you, if you just want to filter the columns where you have like a, a, a direct mathematical proof that there is like an absence of information, so purely constant, you will not remove that many columns. So, so you need something better that lets you identify those, the fields that are basically, that have never been really put to any meaningful use. It turned out that there is, um, there is a, a, a tool that is, a, uh, that, is, uh, that is of prime relevance here, which is informational entropy. So the term, for those of you who are not familiar with, uh, with the Shannon theory of information, it might look a bit scary. But actually, it's something that is much more straightforward um, uh, than you would expect. It's just something, um, so informational entropy is just about um, quantifying the amount of information that you have in a signal, a signal being defined as a sequence of symbols. So if, if here, if we, if we are looking at a, at, a, at a field that contains only two types of values, you know, true or false, um, the idea is that if you have a columns that, uh, that randomly oscillate between, you know, true or false, these columns contain actually quite a lot of data. If, um, if, on the contrary, you have a columns where you have only one line out of a million where the value is true and all the other lines are false, then basically you have this, this, this field in your database contains almost no information whatsoever. And so informational entropy is very, very interesting because you can literally quantify measures in, uh, in bits how much information there is in every single field that you have in your database. And here, you can literally do an analysis ranking all the columns from the richest to the poorest uh, 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 field in your, in your system and eliminate all the tail because it, it barely contains any information and certainly not any amount of information that would be of any relevance for uh, your, um, your supply chain optimization purposes. So that's, that's very interesting, but that may sound, you know, very theoretical. So I'm, I'm here, I'm giving, you know, the formula for um, uh, informational entropy. You can look it up, you know, uh, online. It's not very difficult. It's actually, uh, uh, and I am even, you know, plotting the curve. And you can see that if you have the probability of occurrence of, um, of your, you know, of your binary symbol, it can be extended to um, other type of symbols, you know, numbers, strings, whatever you will see that there is a maximum information if it's, it's, if it's like very unpredictable. And if you, if it, if you, the more you lean on the almost always the same thing, the less information you have. Now, for example, in Envision, so Envision is a domain-specific programming language. Um, we have implemented you know, um, um, informational entropy as an aggregator. And so you can literally take um, you know, a table. Here it's, uh, it's, it's just data from a flat file called data.csv that has three columns. You know, it's a, just a tie example. And then I can plot a summary of how much entropy do I have in every single column. And so you can very easily do that at scale, plot the entropy, sort it out, and then through entropy, you can literally eliminate 90% of the fields that, are, that don't even have a chance, that don't even contain any information whatsoever. Obviously, this is just a starting point, but usually it makes a difference between a project that can start in, in literally that takes years to start or, or literally days to start. So that's, that's very critical. Then the next stage is, okay, now we are making our first observations about supply chains. And the question is, what should we expect? In natural sciences, um, your default expectations is natural is, is what is called normal distributions or, 
also, you know, with bell-shaped curves, also called Gaussians. So if you look at, for example, uh, the, uh, the, the, the height of, um, of, uh, of the human male uh, uh, of age 20, this measurement is normally distributed. And that that's going to be the same for, um, for his weight. It's going to be the same for uh, the concentration of sugar in his blood. And, and pretty much in the realm of living things, pretty much everything is normally distributed. But it, when it comes to supply chain, um, this is not the case. When it comes to supply chain, there is practically, I would say, nothing of interest that is normally distributed. No, the, nearly all the, uh, and that's my principle for you, is that all the uh, distributions of interest are actually zip distributed. And so the zip distribution is actually uh, is put on display. And here, uh, in this formula, you have half that is the zip distribution. And the way to think of it is, you have a, a population of interest, let's say, for example, products, and the measurement of interest for every product is, let's say, for example, the sales volume. So you, what you do with your population of products is that you sort the products from the biggest products, so the product associated with the biggest you know, sales value um, over, um, let's say, a year, for example, and you go down to um, the smallest product. So you rank all the products from the biggest to the smallest. And the question is that can you have a model that predicts, you know, the shape of the curve, and that if I give you the rank, will give me you know, the, um, the sales volume that you can expect. And it turned out that yes, and that's exactly what this zip distribution is about. So here, F is basically the form of a zip Mandelbrot um, uh, uh, law. And, uh, and basically here, uh, K is just you know, the kmth uh, biggest element. Then you have a constant, and then you have Q and S, who are two parameters that are essentially learned. So it's the two, you know, just like you have for, a, new, new, uh, for um, a normal distribution, you have mu, the mean, and sigma, the variance. Uh, that's your two parameters that you can use to, you know, to fit the distribution to a population of interest. Here, you have Q and S, and that's, that's what is this zip mandelbrot law. And here, I would like to point out that literally every single population of interest in supply chain is zip distributed. So it's going to be true for, for, for products, and it's going to be true for products no matter the angle you're looking at. If you're looking at products in terms of, of sales volume, it's a zip distribution. If you look at products from a perspective of, um, of total margin generated over time by the product, it's going to be the same. If you look at uh, products in terms of, um, of, um, uh, of cost of stock out, that's going to be the same. And if you look at, at clients in terms, again, of sales volume or profit, it, again, it's going to be zip distributed. Same thing for suppliers. If you, if you have many stores, obviously, if you have only three stores, you're not going to observe a zip distribution. But if you have, like, uh, you know, hundreds of stores and you sort your stores from, you know, the biggest to the smallest, then um, it's going to be a zip distribution as well. Um, if you think in terms of promotions, you have what, is, what was the expected size of promotions, looking at all the, pros, uh, the promotions that happened in your retail network over the last decades. If you count in terms of, of, of dollars or units, it's going to be a zip distribution. Actually, it's even going to be a zip distribution if you look at things as, for example, dispatch units. You have a distribution center, and um, you have many branches, and you can send inventory from the distribution center to uh, the branches, and that's what you do on a daily basis. If on a, on a daily basis you take the 1,000 units that are being dispatched and you, you put an economic score to all those units from uh, the one that, has, that brings the most value to your supply chain to the one that brings the least value in terms of you know, benefit of dispatching the unit today, you will see that it also follows a zip distribution. And by the way, um, for the zip distribution is basically um, uh, the descendant, if you want, of the Pareto principle. However, uh, zip, the zip distribution is much more tractable and, and I believe much more interesting because it gives you an explicit modelization of what you should expect uh, about, about pretty much any population uh, of interest in supply chain to the point that if you face a distribution, a population that is not zip distributed, then usually, you know, um, uh, something went wrong with your data. Uh, obviously, it's supply chains are wicked problems, as, as we have seen during the first lecture. So it's always possible to somehow engineer a population of interest 
that would not be zip distributed. But unless you assume that somebody is, for some reason, just uh, building such a distribution just for the sake of you know, antagonizing this very principle that I'm describing right now, basically you can expect it's, it's much more likely if you see a population that is not zip distributed that, it, that you have like bogus data uh, or bogus data extraction rather than you, you, rather than you have actually outlined something real. And now, if you want to basically, you know, build, uh, again, through uh, uh, suitable tools, if you want to exploit this concept of um, a zip distribution in, in the real world, you can do that, again, with Envision. And if we look at this snippet, you will see uh, uh, that it's, it's just a few lines of code to do, uh, to do a modelization, to, to apply this sort of modelization to a real uh, data set. So here, I'm, I assume that I have a population of interest called, you know, data.csz, a flat file again. Uh, I have just one column, that is the quantity. I mean, normally you would have an in a product identifier and something plus the quantity. And, uh, and here, the on line four, what I'm doing is that I'm just merely computing the ranks. So, you know, I, I just use the, the, the rank aggregator and I sort against the quantity. So, ops.k is just the rank for every line of the table. And then I enter between the line 6 to 11, I enter a, um, a, a differentiable programming block as explicit as made explicit by Autodef, where I declare three parameters, three scalar parameters, which are basically C, Q, and S, just like the formula that you have uh, on the left of the screen. And then uh, I, I compute, you know, what the zip model uh, predicts. So it's literally um, C divided, you know, by power, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's literally this, uh, this function F that is on the left that I just recompute. I get the zip variable. And then I use a mean square error between the quantity I observe and, and, and what the model is predicting. Et voila, you can literally regress uh, your zip distribution with in literally um, half a dozen lines of code. So there is nothing, even if it may sound a bit sophisticated, actually it's not. I mean, it's literally something that you can do with the proper tools in a, in a, with, very, with a very limited number of lines of code. Which brings me to uh, another aspect, you know, observational aspect of supply chains is the sort of numbers that you, that you would expect at any stage, uh, at, at any level of the supply chain are only small numbers. And that, that is very interesting because um, numbers are, are going to be small. And when I say small, I mean less than 20. Um, and not only you're going to have like few observations, but also what you're going to observe is always going to be um, uh, small numbers. So obviously you would say you can counter argument that, well, the number, you know, depends on the unit. And indeed, if you start thinking in terms of nanogram of t-shirts, you're going to have like gigantic numbers. So take this principle with a grain of salt. Obviously, when I say numbers, I mean numbers that are making, you know, canonical sense from a supply chain perspective, which are what are you trying to observe? What are you trying to optimize? And actually, the reason why we only have small numbers is literally uh, it's really caused by the economies of scale. You see, if you have to deal with t-shirts, so let's, let's, let's have a look at t-shirts, for example, in a store. So maybe you have like a, a, a retail, a retail store that is selling t-shirts. The store might be having thousands of t-shirts in stock. So the number looks, looks big, but the reality is that they have, they have probably, you know, um, uh, hundreds of variants, you know, if you look at all the different type of t-shirts with the shapes and with the variants in terms of size, uh, color. So the reality is that when you start looking at, t uh, uh, at the t-shirts at, I would say, the granularity of relevance for, from a, a supply chain perspective, which is, let's say here, uh, simply in, in, with a slightly simplistic perspective, the SKU, then this store is not going to have thousands of units of T-shirts for a, for a given SKU that represent you know all the same variants. It's it's just going to have a handful, and if you have more T-shirts, then you're not going to have like thousands of T-shirts lying around just like that because it would be you know a nightmare in terms of of, of of processing of, of to just to to move all those T-shirts around. So if you have a, a large number of T-shirts, you know several dozens, 
what are you going to do? Well, you're going to package all those t-shirts into convenient boxes. And that's exactly what happens. So probably if you have a distribution center that deals with a lot of t-shirts because you, you're, you're shipping stuff towards the stores, then the odds are that those t-shirts are actually in actual boxes. And you might even have a box that contain a full assortment of t-shirts with varying sizes and colors so that it's, it's easier you know, to process along the chain. And then if you have many, many boxes you know, lying around, you're, you're not going to, to, have, you know, uh, to have thousands of boxes like that, no. If you have like dozens and dozens of boxes, what you're going to do is that you're going to organize uh, your boxes neatly in pallets. Uh, and so you have like one pallet that, that can you know, wrap um, several dozens of, of, of boxes. And same thing, uh, if you have like many, many pallets, um, uh, you, you're, going to, uh, you're not going to, 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 to have things organized as pallets. It's most likely you're going to have them organized as containers. And again, if you have like many, many containers, then you're going to use a, a cargo ship or something. So my point is that when it comes to numbers in supply chain, um, the thing is, and this is, this is the essence of this principle, it is the number of interests, the number that is truly relevant, is always a small number. And it's, this situation is kind of, cannot be escaped by just moving upward to a higher aggre uh, aggregated level, you see. Because if you move to a higher level of aggregation, then there is some kind of economies of scales that kicks in. And then you want to introduce a mechanism of batching of some kind so that you can lower your cost, you know, your operating cost. And, and that happens you know, multiple times. And thus, no matter which scale you're looking at, whether it is you know, the, the, the final product uh, sold by the unit in a store, or if, you, if you're actually a mass producer, uh, it's always a game of small numbers. Even if you have a factory that produces you know, millions of t-shirts, chances are that you have like gigantic batches. And so the number that are of interest to you are not the number of t-shirts, but literally the number of batches that you do, which is going to be a much smaller number. And so um, where am I getting at with this principle? I mean, first, you have to look at what does you know, most methods in terms of you know, scientific computing you know, um, or, 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 or statistics, what does it look like usually? Well, it turned out that in most other fields uh, that are basically non-supply chain, it's pretty much the opposite that is prevalent. You, know, you have large numbers, large number of observations. And when you have one observation, in itself, it's a, it's, it's a big number where precision matter. But here it's very, it's discrete, small. And, and my proposition is that we need, based on this principle, to have tools that are deeply you know, accommodating, that, are, that, have, that, are, that completely embrace the fact that we are going to have small numbers instead of large numbers. And if, if you have tools that, are only, that have only been designed uh, with the law of large numbers in mind, and large either because you have many observations or because you have large numbers, then you have a complete misfit when it comes to supply chain. So, um, and by the way, this has profound software implications. If you have small numbers, then um, there is many ways to um, make, to, to have the software layers take advantage of this observation. For example, if you look at, uh, at the data set of, um, of, of um, transaction lines for an hypermarket, you will notice that, uh, that was my experience in my observation, that 80% of the lines have a quantity that is being sold to a final client in an hypermarket that is exactly one. So that means that um, do you need 64 bits of information to represent this information? No, that's a complete waste of you know, space and processing time. So you have like one or two orders of magnitude to be gained uh, operationally in embracing this concept. This is not just wishful thinking, they are real operational gain. And, um, and you might think that computers nowadays are very, you know, um, are, are miracle, and they are, and they are exceedingly powerful. And yet, we, if you have more processing power at your disposal, then you can, you can have more, you know, advanced recipes that do things that are even better for your supply chain. So uh, it, it's pointless to waste this processing power just because you have a paradigm that expects large numbers where uh, in, in a situation where small numbers prevail. And also, um, and then that brings me to uh, my, my last uh, observational principle for today, is that patterns are everywhere in supply chain. And in order to understand what, what is being hinted here, 
let's have a look at a classic supply chain problem where patterns are literally usually considered as absent. Route optimization. So the, the classic problem of route optimization is the following. You assume that you have a list of deliveries that are to be made, and you want, or, or that when you can place you know, deliveries on the map, and you want to find the route that minimizes the transportation time. So you want to, have to establish basically a route that goes through every single delivery point while minimizing the total transportation time. So if you look at this problem, it looks like to be a completely geometric problem. It, it, um, there is no question whether you know it, it, there are, it's a it's a difficult you know algorithmic problem, and it looks at the first glance that it's there is no patterns whatsoever involved in the resolution of this problem, and my proposition for you is no completely wrong wrong perspective. This is when when you if you had, if you had, if you attack the problem from this angle, you are looking at a mathematical problem, not at a supply chain problem. So. Supply chains are iterated games. It's a thing that, that where the problems are going to manifest themselves again and again and again. So if you are in the business of organizing you know, deliveries, um, uh, the odds are that you are you know, doing deliveries every single day. Uh, so it's, it's not one route. It's literally one route per day, at least. And then um, if you have, you know, uh, probably and most likely, you don't have a single driver and single vehicle. If you're in the business of doing deliveries, then chances are that you have uh, an entire fleet of vehicles and drivers. And so the problem first is not so much of that you have just one route. You have a whole fleet to optimize. And, thus, and, and this is a game that, you, that repeats itself every single day. And that's where all the patterns uh, uh, appears. So first, you know, the map, the points are not randomly distributed on the map. Um, you have hotspots, you know, you have hot um, geographical areas. You have, you have maybe addresses that get, you know, uh, deliveries almost every day. For example, if you're, if you're in a large city and you have uh, the headquarter of a large company, Odds are that if you are, let's say, um, you know, a, a large uh, e-commerce company, that you're delivering packages to this address every single day of the year. I mean, whenever it's up, whenever basically business is open and that uh, deliveries are happening. So you have hotspots. But then those hotspots, they are not immutable. You know, they have their seasonality of their own. Maybe there are some neighborhoods that are very, very quiet during the summer or during the winter. So those there are patterns and. If you want to be very good at playing the game of, of doing those, this, uh, this route optimization, you have to take into account that the fact that not only uh, you know where are those hotspots are going to happen, but you know how they are going you know, to, to displace themselves during the course of the year. And then you have, you have the traffic. Um, it, you should not think about you know, um, the geometric distance it's, uh, and the traffic is time dependent. So if you start doing the route at a certain point of time, so if, if the driver start at this point of time during the day, you know that as uh, the driver progress through his route, the traffic will change. And so you need to, if you want to play this game um, very well, you need to take into account that there is like traffic patterns and those traffic patterns are changing and there are things that can be reliably predicted uh, in advance, for example, uh, in Paris, uh, 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. It's basically the entire city is completely jammed, and you don't have to be, you know, an expert in forecasting. It's like a super basic observation. Uh, so, does, and and then so you have the things that are like uh, constant, and then you might have things that just happen on the spot, like accident, that disturb the the usual patterns of um, of traffic, and then. Again, if we look in terms of, of deliveries, you know, the mathematical perspective assumes that all those points are basically the same, but they are absolutely not. You know, you might have like VIP clients, and maybe you know you have specific addresses that where you have to deliver. But one address, it, it just so happened that you're nearly delivering half of the truck, so you unload literally half of your shipment in this one address. So it's it's literally a really key, you know, uh, milestone in your in your route is to make sure that those things are, get delivered. So again, that means that when you want to have a route optimization, you need to be aware of the context. And, and also, you, you will never, in, in this sort of problems, you, you very frequently have problems with the fact that you have imperfect data about the world. And for example, maybe a bridge is closed and, um, and the software doesn't know about it. But what is infuriating for um, you know, the driver is that if every single day the software comes back to propose a route that is nonsensical, 
because it's still proposing to go through this bridge that is closed. The problem is not to not know that the bridge was, uh, was actually closed the first time because you could not know. But if you know, the problem manifests itself again and again and again, and that, there was, that basically the software never learns and always proposes something that is supposed to be optimal, but people are always fighting against the system, then, then it's, not a, a good, you know, uh, it's not a good practical route optimization solution from a supply chain perspective. And that's the point, is that when, when we look at the supply chain situations, there are plenty of patterns. There are patterns actually all over the place, and, um, and we have to be careful of not being distracted by the, I would say, by some elegant mathematical structure of one problem, you know, that this type of consideration applies to time series forecasting, but uh, also applies to time series forecasting. I took the, the route optimization problem just because the problem with this example was more, was more manifest. So um, as, as a concluding thought is, we need to really observe the supply chain from all the dimensions that are observable and not the ones that are, I would say, obvious or where the solution presents itself in, a, in an elegant way. So that brings me to um, the second series of, uh, of principles. So, so far we have seen you know, four principles that relate to how should I even look at my supply chain. So it was, you know, it's an indirect, you know, observation via enterprise software. We need to sort out in the mess, you know, what is relevant from what is not. The entropy is very practical. And we observe that, you know, um, distributions are, uh, that we have zips distribution all over the place. And it's always going to be about small numbers. And, and that we, despite the fact that we have small numbers, we are go still going to have patterns all over the place. So it's not like... Do, even if we have um, uh, only, I would say, um, a limited set of uh, observations, usually the patterns are so strong that it's not a problem. We will still see patterns emerge. Um, now the question is, how do we act? And then, obviously, mathematically speaking, when we want to decide what is the best course of action, we do an optimization of some kind. That's you know, the quantitative perspective in place. And the first thing um, is that as soon as we have a piece of optimization logic, you know, in production in supply chains, issue will arise, you know, bugs. Um, and and uh, so why is that? I mean, first, you know, this is just, uh, just fact. Uh, if you've ever seen, you know, uh, a piece of enterprise software that is devoid of bugs, I don't know on which, you know, planet you've been living so far, because certainly that's that's absolutely not my, um, uh, my very basic observation. So un enterprise softwares are a very complex beast and they are full of bugs. So as you craft your own optimization logic for your own supply chain, there will be bugs. There will be plenty of issues. Obviously, um, if you have too many issues, the piece of, of logic that you're considering will never go to production. So here, I'm, always, I'm adopting you know, perspective where I have a piece of logic that was good enough so that at, at a point in time in the past, it was good enough so that somebody decided to put this thing in production. Which means that if we face an issue now, it's probably an edge case of some kind. You know, if it wasn't an edge case, if the software was crashing or the logic was dysfunctioning every single time, uh, it would never have made its way to production. So, if it crashed now, it's probably because something well, unexpected happened in terms of, of logic. You know, there was like new conditions. And so you could think, oh, but, um, where, and, and this, the idea of this principle is that it takes, you know, five to ten rounds to fix any issue. And, and when I say five to ten rounds, I mean you're going to face an issue, you're going to look at the issue, understand the root cause and everything, and then try to apply a fix. But most of the time, the fix is not going to fix the problem. You will discover that there was a problem hidden inside the problem. Or the problem that you thought that you fixed was actually not what caused the problem in the first place. Or that actually the situation has just reveals a broader class of problems and what you've just fixed is was a small instance of a broader class of problems and you have other problems that will keep occurring that are just variant of the one that you thought you've just solved. And so, um, and, and again, you, supply chains are complex, ever-changing beasts, you know, that operates in the real world. So it's, it's kind of messy. And, and so it's very, very difficult in silico to have a design 
that is probably correct against all situations. You know, it's, it's not realistic um, uh, in most of the situations. Thus, you do a best effort to attempt to fix a problem, and then it's literally you have to put, you know, your um, revised logic to the test of the a real world experience to see if it works or if it doesn't. And you will have to iterate to get the problem fixed. And so my, with this principle where I state it takes, you know, between five and ten iterations to get the problem fixed, it has profound consequence on um, the velocity of atoms, on the frequency on which you do refresh for uh, for, to where you recompute, where you rerun your supply chain optimization logic. Because you see, if you follow this principle to its conclusion, it means that, for example, if you have a bit of logic that is producing quarter, you know, forecast, that is forecasting demand for the next two years, and you only run this logic once per quarter, how much time will it take to fix any problem that you face with this forecasting logic? Well, according to this principle, it will take, you know, between one and two years, which is insanely long, insanely long. And even if you have a piece of logic that runs every month, maybe you have like, you, you have your SNOP, you know, practice and you revise your SNOP plan once a month. And so you have your running forecast and you refresh them on a monthly basis. How much time going to take, is it going to take um, to actually fix a problem? I mean, I mean, worst case, it's going to take a year to fix the problem. And that sort of worst case will happen routinely. So, uh, so there is a vivid interest to basically increase the frequency. That's why, by the way, one of the common practice at LOCAD is that um, every single you know, bits of logic needs to run on a daily basis, even if we are looking at forecasts five years, five years ahead. Those forecasts have to be refreshed on a daily basis, even if, obviously, they don't change much from one day to the next. The problem is not of gaining statistical accuracy by refreshing the forecast according to the most recent pieces of data. This is not the problem at all. The problem is to make sure that the logic is run frequently enough so that when we face a problem, an issue, a bug, and this will happen, you know, it's just, just a matter of time, then this thing gets fixed within a reasonable time frame. And by the way, um, this, is, this observation, I, I was not alone to, have, to make this observation. Um, there are very, very smart engineering teams at Netflix that popularize, you know, uh, the idea of chaos engineering. They realize themselves that, you know, those edge cases were rare and, um, and uh, the only way to fix all those problems was to repeat the experience more frequently. And guess what? Um, they decided that because they had edge cases that were too rare, what about, um, you know, uh, uh, having a piece of software, that's the Chaos Monkey, it's a real thing, it's a software product. So the Chaos Monkey is a software product that is only, you know, that is only present to basically add chaos to your software infrastructure. So the, the role of the Chaos Monkey is to create tons of problems at the level of your software infrastructure. So it's going to create, you know, network disruption, it's going to basically create random crashes uh, in your machines, and, and it's only there to add, you know, ambient, uh, uh, to bring the chaos in your, uh, in, in, in your uh, IT operation to the next level so that all those edge cases manifest themselves much faster and so that you can fix them in turn much faster. So it may sound, it may sound you know, on face value, it may sound like insane. Why would you have like, to introduce an, uh, an, uh, an extra level of chaos in your operations? Well, it turned out that, you know, in terms of reliability, Netflix is literally, they are, they are top of the game. They are excellent. And this idea is just because a, a very correct understanding of the situation where they understand that problems need, whenever they, 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 they face, a, 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 I would say, a software-driven problem or software-related problem, it takes many iterations to go to the bottom of it. And thus, the only way to basically, you know, um, uh, get to the bottom of the problem is to iterate rapidly, which requires many iterations. And the Chaos Monkey is just one way to increase the speed of iteration. From a supply chain perspective, it's not necessarily super applicable, but uh, the Chaos Monkey is not necessarily, you know, a, a tool of prime interest. But the things that you have to think of is literally you need whatever logic that you have for, um, to optimize your supply chain, it needs to run at high velocity, high frequency. Otherwise, you will never fix any of the problems that you face. Now, age supply chains are quasi-optimal. And when I say age, uh, I mean, you know, 
two decades plus of age. Um, another way to state this principle is, uh, would be your supply chain predecessors were not all idiots. Um, so when you look at you know, supply chain optimization initiatives, usually, I mean, it too frequently, uh, I, and I've seen that you know, over and over, too frequently there are like some grand ambitions. Let's you know, cut the stock levels by half. Let's bring the service level from 95 to 99%. Let's eliminate stockouts. Um, let's, you know, divide the lead times by two. You know, those big unidirectional moves where you take one KPI and say, you know what, we are going um, to really crunch it. We are going to take this one variable and just, you know, push it into the right direction massively. And my point is that, uh, what I've observed, is that all those initiatives invariably fails. For the very, very blunt reason is that when you, lay, when you take a supply chain that has been in operation for decades, I mean, um, uh, it's the, the, the company is operating in a competing environment. So it's a pretty tough environment. It's very, very difficult to survive while being completely stupid, you know. So any company that has been operating with, you know, a sizable degree of success for decades, there is usually some kind of latent wisdom in the way they are doing, where things have been done. So for example, if service levels are at 95, then odds are that yes, you can bring the service level to 90% service level. You can, but chances are that if you do that, you vastly increase the stock level and you create a massive amount of dead stock in the process. And same thing, if you basically go, you have a certain amount of, of stock and then you have like a massive initiative that say, let's divide this amount of stock by slash it, let's slash it by two. Um, there is, I mean, the odds are that if you do that, you will create massive um, quality of service problems that are just not sustainable. So basically, you might do that one year and then you will revert back to the previous situation. So what I observe is, um, as, as, as um, I've seen, you know, many supply chain practitioners that do not understand this, this principle that age supply chain are unidirectionally, you know, quasi-optimal is that you tend to have like oscillations around you know, the local optimum. And what do I mean by that? It's, and again, you have to keep in mind, I'm not saying that edge supply chains are optimal. This is not what I'm saying. I'm saying that they are unidirectionally uh, uh, um, quasi-optimal. And if you look at this analogy about the Grand Canyon, is that when you have only you know, a force, a unidirectional force that applies, just like you know, gravity here, the river is going to carve the optimal path gravity-wise, and, and it's, not, it's not because you were to apply a gravity that would be 10 times stronger that you would have a river flowing in straight line. The, the river will still you know, undergo as many convolutions. So it's, it's possible to re-engineer that to have something that flows in straight line, but then there is more than gravity that you have to overcome. So it's, uh, suddenly the problem becomes multidimensional. And that's my point, is that with edge supply chains, if you want to bring sizable improvements, you need to look at, and usually you need to tweak many variables at once. You cannot say, we focus on just one variable, and then this is it, we will get results. This is not the case. Um, uh, again, if your company has been operating for decades, and that's the status quo, um, it's, uh, your predecessors were not all idiots. It's probably that they did a few things you know, right uh, in their own time, and thus the, the odds that you stumble upon a supply chain that is vastly dysfunctional and nobody ever paid any attention to that is, I would say, minimal. It may happen. Again, supply chains are wicked problems. So it's, it's, it's possible to engineer completely, you know, dysfunctional situation at scale, but it's going to be very infrequent at best. And now, another, another aspect is that local optimization only displays problems instead of solving them. And in order to understand that is that you have to understand that supply chains are systems. And when you are thinking in terms of supply chain performance, it's only the system-wide performance that is of interest. The local performance is not, I mean, it is relevant, but it's only, you know, a part of the picture. And why is, why is it a problem? Because there is this, this common way of thinking that you can, you know, that you can apply divide and conquer to address problems in general, not just you know, supply chain problems. So for example, divide and conquer can take you know, many forms. 
And in supply chain, for example, you could say, well, we want to optimize you know, stock levels in a store. So you have a retail network with many stores. And you want to say, OK, we have an initiative where we are going to improve the stocks in every single store. So we start by taking one first store and we optimize the stock in this one store. But the problem is that if you have, a store, you, have, uh, you have a network of stores and you have a distribution center, you have distribution centers, each distribution center serving many stores, it's, it's completely trivial to micro-optimize one store and to achieve excellent quality of service for this one store at the expense of all the other stores. The, 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 the problem, it's, it's completely incorrect to have this divide and conquer perspective. The, the correct perspective is to think that whenever you have like one unit available in the distribution center, the question you should ask yourself is, if I am about to dispatch this one unit that is currently in my distribution center to any of the store, where is this unit most needed? You know, what, what is the move? that is the most profitable to me. And you see that the problem of optimizing the dispatch of inventory, or basically the inventory allocation problem, is a problem that may only make sense at the store level, because, uh, at the, sorry, at the system level and not at the store level. So that's why, that's why you, you cannot have like a, a local optimization at the store, uh, uh, in, a, in a supply chain. If basically you optimize what happened in a store, you're going to basically create problems in an other store. And, and so, when I say local, you, this, this principle should not just be understood from a, a geographical perspective. It can be just, you know, um, a purely logical matter within the supply chain. So, for example, if you are an e-commerce and, uh, and you have, like, many, you know, um, uh, many categories that you serve, maybe in terms of purchasing, you want to allocate varying budgets for the various categories. And that's another type of divide and conquer. But if you, if you, you know, partition your budgets and you allocate, you know, at the beginning of the year or mm, a, a budget for each category, what happens if you, you basically have two categories, A and B, and you allocate, you know, they, they both get at the beginning of the year the same budget, but then during the first quarter, you realize that the first category has doubled, I would say, in terms of demand, while um, the demand for the product of the second category has, has been divided by two. Um, here, you end up with a problem of you have completely, I would say, uh, the incorrect allocation of funds between those two categories. So the challenge here is that, again, you cannot apply any kind of logic of divide and conquer. Or rather, if you do, if you basically use kind, some kind of local optimization techniques, then you end up creating problems as you optimize, as you create your supposedly optimized solution. That brings me um, to um, the, 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 last, the last principle, which is probably the, the, the most tricky among all the, all the principles that I've, that I've presented today, is that better problems trumps better solutions. And that, that can be, you know, exceedingly uh, confusing, especially among certain, I would say, academic circles, but, uh, but not only. So what do I mean by that? The typical way, you know, things are presented to you through, I would say, a classic, um, through, I would say, classic educations, is that a problem, a well-defined problem is presented to you, and then you start looking for solutions for these problems, and maybe, you know, um, you will come up with a, a, maybe a better solution for the same problem. You know, if it's a mathematical problem, um, you might have a, a classroom. The professor, you know, spell out the problem. Every student look for a solution. And there will be, you know, a, a, a one student that has a more concise, more elegant solution for the problem. And that's going to be the best solution. But in reality, things do not happen that way in supply chain. Or it's, it's, it's a, I would say, a very misrepresentation on how you can actually bring improvement to a supply chain. So if we go, you know, 60 years back in the past and we look at the problem of, of, of cooking. So cooking is a very time-consuming activity. And, uh, and, and so, 60 years ago, people uh, who are looking at what solution could be done in the future to basically remove, reduce the amount of efforts uh, that you have to bring to basically cook the meal of the whole household. And so people were imagining, you know, solutions, and they would, and that was, so, and they would think, well, cooking takes a lot of time, but maybe we could bring, you know, a robot that would do the cooking, 
And, and so that would be like a massive productivity boost for whoever is in charge uh, of the cooking. And this sort of thinking was prevalent, you know, during the 50s, 60s. If you read, you know, uh, Asimov or the, the novels of Asimov, you will see android robots that just, that are literally, you know, doing what humans do just faster and so that they don't have to do it themselves. Obviously, fast forward, uh, it's pretty much obvious that this is not the way um, things happen. You know, nowadays, if you want to minimize, you know, your amount of cooking efforts, you're just going to, to buy pre-cooked meals. And by the way, if we go back to my previous lecture, that's exactly another example of problem displacement. You know, you, you replace a problem, which is cooking, by a, 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 a supply chain solution. So obviously, if you buy pre-cooked meals, um, supplying hypermarkets with pre-cooked meals or, 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 or stores with pre-cooked meals is supply chain-wise much harder than uh, providing the same stores with the raw products because you have many more references. And, and uh, in terms of expiration dates, it's they are typically shorter. So, um, so, so literally, the problem was solved through, uh, I would say, a superior supply chain solution. But the supply chain solution was not that we have you know, provided a better, you know, um, cooking solution is that we have removed entirely the cooking problem from the problem and, and redefined the problem as a whole as I just want to have a, a halfway decent meal with the minimum amount of effort. That was the problem that, 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 that is being solved here. So you see, um, in terms of, of supply chains, usually in, from the academic perspective, and here um, one good example would be, you know, the Kaggle competition and um, where you have a data set, you have a problem, and then you have like potentially hundreds or thousands of teams that compete to get um, the best, you know, uh, prediction on these data sets. So you have like a well-defined problem and then thousands of solutions that competes. And the problem with this mindset that it gives you the impression that if you want to deliver improvement for your supply chain, what you need is a better solution. And the essence of the principle is that Yes, a better solution might help marginally, but only marginally. Usually the sort of things that, that really helps is when you redefine the problem. And that is surprisingly difficult. That is surprisingly difficult, and that's very much applicable when it comes to quantitative problems as well. So when you have like a quantitative problems, usually what you are optimizing is not even the right thing. So you need to rethink what I am actually, what is my actual supply chain strategy? What is the key problem that I should be optimizing? And, and, and usually, you see, where I say in, in, in many circles, people are looking at the problems the wrong way. They, they think of problems as if they are completely static, immutable, and they look for better solutions. I don't deny that having a better time series forecasting algorithm can be of help. But time series forecasting belongs to the realm of statistical forecasting. You know, if, if there is like a, a field of studies, that's going to be statistical forecasting. This is not the field of, 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 of the mastery of supply chain. And so if we are back to, you know, the, the, my very initial example about um, the, the travel suitcase, you realize that, you know, if I were to take this better problems trump better solution, it would be I have this, um, um, this suitcase with wheels. And the only way to improve the suitcase is to have better wheels that are more resistant, that, have, uh, you know, um, that are more durable, that, that, that roll better. But obviously, this is, um, this is not the case. I mean, as soon as you think about adding wheels to a suitcase, um, as soon as you have like halfway decent wheels, the fact that you have superior wheels is not going to make much of a difference. Yes, if you have slightly better wheels, you have, you're going to have a slightly better wheel suitcase, but only, only marginally. The key improvement was absolutely not for wheels suitcase, was absolutely not about the wheels. It, it was about the handle. So, so it was something that, was, that had nothing to do at first glance with the wheels. And I believe that's why it took 40 years plus to come up with a solution is that you have to think out of the box truly to um, basically let the better problem emerge. And that's exactly what, uh, what this, with this quantitative principle is about, is to challenge the problems that you face. Maybe you're not thinking hard enough about the problem. Maybe you're, um, there is this tendency of falling in love with the solution 
while you should be fully involved with the problem and all the things that you don't really understand about the problem instead, um, instead of, 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 of having a focus on, on the solutions where as soon as you have like a well-defined problem, um, usually having a good solution is just a mundane matter of, of, of execution, which is not that hard. So in conclusion for, for today, you see, um, supply chain as a field of study, we have plenty of things that, that are maybe, you know, very impressive and that represent the proven. You know, um, and again, if you, if you look at authoritative materials, you will find plenty of perspectives that gives you plenty of things that are possibly, I would say, or, or seemingly, you know, established authoritative um, uh, things that are um, potentially impressive by their degree of sophistications. But um, the question that I would like uh, to ask, you know, this audience is that could it be that all of that is, might be, you know, severely misguided? Are we, are we really confident that those elements, you know, time series forecasting, um, operational research, that it's actually the proper perspective on the problem? And no matter the amount of sophistication that you have brought to, to the table, and no matter how many decades of engineering and efforts have been invested in pursuing those directions, um, are, we, are we really on the right track? And you see, today, I'm, I'm presenting a series of principles that I believe to be, uh, uh, I hope that uh, they are really, you know, of prime relevance for supply chain, but, um, uh, but that is my hope. I'm pretty sure that they are going to look like kind of weird for most of you. And so, so you see, we have two, two words here. We have the proven and the weird. And the question is that if we look ahead, uh, what is going to happen, you know, a few, a few decades from now? Uh, and, and my hope is that, again, if we look uh, back at the very nature of the progress, is that it tends to be quite, quite surprising. You know, progress unfolds in chaotic, nonlinear fashion. And the idea with those, the principles that I've outlined today is to, be a, is to let you embrace, you know, a world that is highly chaotic, where there is a room for the unexpected, where um, you can, and that those principles can literally help you to roll out faster, with more reliability, with more efficiency, you know, um, solution that will basically bring improvement to your supply chains from a quantitative perspective. So I guess it's time for question now. So let me have a look at, uh, at the question, if any. So, uh, so I have one first, uh, one first question is that, Van Gill, uh, how does zip distribution compare to Pareto law? Um, I would say, you know, the Pareto law is basically the rule of thumb of the 80-20. I mean, there are more sophisticated versions of that, but it's basically that, um, you know, the top 20% of your products are going to do 80% of your sales volumes, these sort of things. Um, so obviously between zip distributions and, and Pareto, there is a lot of things that are, I would say it's the same intuition. However, uh, from a quantitative perspective, you know, um, the zip distribution is an explicit predictive model. So what you gain with a, a zip distribution is it's not just an intuition of the 80-20 rules. It's literally a model that you can use, you know, w uh, on data. And, and, you, and, it, and this model has predictive capabilities. That's why it's not, I mean, yes, it's the same intuition. But from a quantitative perspective, it's, it's two worlds apart because literally with the zips distribution, you have a predictive model that can be you know, challenged against data sets in a very straightforward manner. So, so there is a relationship, but in practice, it's quite, it's quite different. Um, so wouldn't the zip Mandelbrot be better viewed as a logarithmic curve to see supply chain fluctuations? Um, COVID-19 reporting like uh, epidemiologists do, in reporting COVID-19 death in this way. Um, yes, I mean, that's, again, that Jesus Christ that is asking the question. Um, so, yes, absolutely. I mean, if you, at, a, at a, I would say, almost a philosophical level, the question is that, do you live, and that's a word that I'm stealing to Nassim Taleb, do you live in mediocristan or do you live in extremistan? Supply chains, and most are actually of the human affairs, lives in the world of extremistan, not in mediocristan. Um, so, so yes, um, that's, that's again, um, so logarithmic curves, absolutely. If you want to visualize, you know, 
um, the amplitude, for example, if you want to visualize the amplitudes of promotions uh, and you put on the same graph all your past promotion for large retail networks over the last 10 years, if you do that with a, a regular scale, odds are that the best promotion ever over the last 10 years is so big that everything is invisible just because the last, the biggest promotion ever was three times as big as the second biggest promotion. So, so indeed, if, if you don't have like a logarithmic scales, you, you don't see anything. Um, so, so yes, it's, it's part of, uh, I would say, the same idea, and it's very relevant. Again, my point was to give you something that is very actionable. So here I'm giving you, with a zip, Monday brought uh, distribution, I give you, you know, a model that you can literally roll out with a few lines of code. So it, it's more than just, you know, a way, um, than, than just a logarithmic view of the data. But I agree, again, that's kind of the same intuition uh, at the core. And again, if I go at a philosophical level, um, go read again, you know, Nassim Taleb, uh, Major Christian versus Extremistan in his anti-fragile book. That will basically give you, uh, I would say, the, the super high level um, uh, philosophical perspective on the case. So, AXA, a, a question on a topic on local supply chain optimization. Um, are you relating to underlying data which you see supporting supply chain network collaboration and SNOP? Um, uh, well, local, the, my, my problem with local optimization is, is that, uh, and, and what I'm stating, I'm, I'm, sta I'm putting this principle forward because most modern companies, you know, the large companies that operate the large supply chain that we know today, have uh, typically a matrix organization, you know, where, where the organization has, is organized along the lines of a matrix with a divide and conquer mindset. And so, due to the fact that you have like a matricial organization, um, you end up with local optimization by design just because it is the scope that is relevant to the team doing the optimization. So, you see, it's just the problem that, um, that that's the problem with, for example, uh, another case of local optimization, a different flavor of the problem, is when you have two different teams, one that is doing the forecast, the other one that is doing, um, uh, that is actually, so one, one team is doing the demand forecast, and one team decide uh, what to do in terms of purchasing. You see, that's literally, uh, the statistical analysis is an optimization, and what you do in terms of optimization has an impact on what you do in the, on the optimization side. The, the two problems, demand forecasting and purchasing optimization, are completely you know, entangled. And, and my point is that you cannot you know, perform a local optimization focusing only on percentages of error forecast-wise, and then do only a purchase optimization where you only look at the purchasing efficiency. It's not going to be efficient at all. You have system effects, and you have to bring all those things together. And, um, and I think that the biggest problems for most you know, large companies, established companies, um, that are you know, driving large supply chains today, is that um, when you want to play the game of the quantitative optimization of a supply chain, you have to think you know, system-wide. You have to think company-wide. And that goes completely against decades of Ma uh, of matrix sedim sedimentation within the company, where, where people even forgot you know, that there was an outside world. You only look at, uh, at your organization through the prism of your well-defined boundaries, but they don't make sense. They, 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 they really don't. Um, again, another example, because it's, it's a great problem. An example would be if you're looking at stores and, and stock in stores, the, you, have, you, you have the stock serve two purposes. Uh, on one side, the stock is serving the purpose of fulfilling the customer demand. That's one purpose for the stock. But on the other side, the stock is also fulfilling the purpose of, of merchandising. So basically, you have, uh, and if you want to have the right amount of stock, you need to basically embrace the problem of quality of service, and you need to embrace the problem of store, you know, appeal. Of um, it should be you know very appealing in terms of very plenty so that it's it's very interesting and appealing for the clients which is more like a marketing problems. So and 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 guess what? Well, in the company you have like a, a marketing division and a supply chain division and they don't necessarily play together when it comes to supply chain optimization. My point is that if you don't bring all of those things together, um, the optimization will not work. And back to your SNOP concern. Um, 
the problem with SNLP is that um, yes, people come together, but only to have meetings, you know, and this is not very efficient. Um, so I have, we have published uh, um, a few months ago uh, a look at TV episode about SNOP. So um, let's have a look at that if you want to have like a specific discussion to SNOP. And I'm maybe going to get to the next question. Um, how should we distribute the time energy between um, supply chain strategy and quantitative execution? Uh, and that's a question from Newton Peters. Ah, oh, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. The answer is, and that's go back to uh, my lecture number two um, with uh, the, the, the fourth idea of, uh, um, of quantitative supply chain, is that you need complete robotization of the mundane task. That's, that's a starting point. So that precisely all your time, all your energy is devoted to the continuous strategic improvement of your numerical recipes. So when you tell me, oh, what time do I have to spend on, 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 on strategic thinking, the answer is 100%. You know, why should you, why should you spend time doing things that the machine could do? You know, uh, and this is this old IBM saying that machine, um, uh, if, if there is work to be done, we have computers for that. Humans, we need them to think. Um, so, so literally, if, if, all you, if you spend you know, more than, let's say, I mean, realistically, if you spend more than 10% of your time dealing with mundane aspect of, of supply chain execution um, and, and firefighting and whatnot, you have, you have a problem with your own methodology. I mean, um, supply chain experts are too rare and too scarce to waste their time and energy and, and mental bandwidth on, 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 I would say, mundane execution problem that should be automated in the first place. So, so here, it's literally all your, and you need to put yourself in, uh, to follow a methodology that lets you devote, you know, almost all your energy into strategic thinking, but it's not like you're thinking, you know, uh, the head in the cloud. No, no, it's strategic thinking, but that gets transformed into better, impl that gets immediately implemented as superior numerical recipes that actually drive the day-to-day -day supply chain execution. So you invest all your efforts for the strategic improvement of software pieces. And that's, by the way, the, that goes back to the, my third lecture on product-oriented delivery. And when I say product, I mean software product-oriented delivery. Um, so uh, Elisa Pissin, I'm not sure if I pronounce it correctly. I'm very, very sorry. Is it possible to hypothesize uh, a sort of sailing analysis, you know, the best improvement possible for supply chain problems given their systemic um, uh, formulation? I would say no, absolutely not. <laughs> and that's, uh, you see, uh, thinking that you have some kind of, you know, optimum, that there is some, some, some sailing is basically the equivalent in supply chain to say that there is a limit to the human ingenuity. I mean, obviously, that's, that's, an act of, that's an act of faith. You know, I, I don't have any proof that there is no limit to the human ingenuity. That, that's one of my core beliefs. But um, you see, you can, um, th that's the thing. Supply chains are wicked problems. You can cheat. You can, you can literally transform the problem. And you can even transform what appears to be a big problem into a big solution and, and, and a growth, a potential for growth for the company. I mean. Again, just an example, just look at, um, at, um, at, at Amazon. You know, Amazon, Jeff Bezos in the early thousand understand that if you want to be, you know, a super good retailer, he will need, you know, a, a massive rock solid uh, software infrastructure. But the problem is that this massive uh, industrial production grade, you know, software infrastructure that he needs to run Amazon, you know, the, the retail e-commerce at the time, is incredibly costly. It costs the company billions. So yes, they have the best e-commerce because they have the best software infrastructure, but it's insanely expensive. So what are the, uh, the teams at Amazon, what do they do? Well, they decide that instead of having uh, all those cloud computing infrastructure do, to be just you know, an investment that is crazy expensive for Amazon, they turn it into a commercial product. And if you look at Amazon nowadays, actually, this crazy uh, uber large scale, um, um, you know, hardware computing infrastructure is actually one of the primary source of, of profit for Amazon. So you see, 
when, when you start thinking about wicked problems, you can literally always redefine the problem in a way that is superior. So that's why I think it's very, very misguided to think that there is some kind of optimal. You see, this is, this is when you think in terms of sailing analysis, this is exactly what you think about, I have a wheeled suitcase, and, and you ask the question is, do I have optimal wheels? And indeed, if you look at a fixed problem, at a fixed problem, then yes, you have from a fixed problem perspective, you have a solution that is probably quasi-optimal. And, and for example, if I look at the wheels um, that are available nowadays for, for, uh, for suitcases, for travel suitcases, I would say, yes, they are probably, they are probably quasi-optimal. You know, there is not so much to be looking for in terms of improvement of the wheels. As far as the handles is concerned, it looks nowadays that the handle looks uh, pretty optimal. But is there something that is completely obvious that I'm missing? I just don't know. Maybe there is a way to make the whole thing much, much better. It might be completely, you know, once I see if it, there is maybe, you know, an invention that is just not made yet, and then as soon as we see it, it will appear to us, to everybody, completely self-evident. So that's why, that's why we need to think that there is no such thing as a sailing for the problems because the problems are made up. You know, uh, it's, it's completely arbitrary to say that this is a problem. You can, you can literally redefine the problem and decide that the, the game being played is, uh, is to be played according to completely different rules. So that's, and again, this is very puzzling because people like to think that I have a neat, nicely designed problem and I can find solutions because all your entire education has been resolving around this sort of problems. You know, um, that's, that's the problem with, I would say, the modern education system, the modern Western education system, is that it emphasizes this solution-finding mindset where we give you a problem and you write a solution and then we are going to assess whether the solution is good or bad, while this is not a very interesting question. A much more interesting question is what, wa what was the quality of the problem itself? Now, uh, Emir, um, Emir Tassio, Tassio Glue, again, I'm very sorry for, for, for mispronouncing your names. You say that the best solutions will solve the problems, but sometimes finding the best solution can, uh, can, uh, can cost both time and, 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 and money. Our workarounds for this. Absolutely. You see, again, that's if you have a solution that is theoretically correct, but it takes forever to implement, this is not a good solution. And that's why I say, I, I, you know, and again, this sort of thinking is tend to be prevalent in, in certain, you know, academic circles, is they want to think the perfect solution according to typically narrow-minded mathematical criteria. That has nothing to do with the real world. That's exactly what I was talking of when I, I say, you know, the route optimization problem. Um, every, you know, every quarter or so, there is some kind of, of professor that comes to me and says, uh, Dear Mr. Gervais Morel, could you look at my al online algorithm to solve the, the route optimization problem? You know, because uh, you can solve this problem online or offline. So they, nowadays, the, the most of the buyers, the, the, the flavors that I have to review are the, the online flavors. And, and guess what? Every quarter I get you know, a, people that are suggesting this sort of, of paper or material to me. And, and, and my, my response is every single time, you are not solving the right problem. I, it's literally, I don't care about your solution. And uh, because you're not even uh, thinking correctly about the problem itself. And so when you have those super complex solution, again, um, this is the problem that I was pointing out. The progress should not be confused with sophistication. You know, m this is a very misguided perception that, that you can, you know, progress, that there is an arrow of progress that goes from something that is simple to the sophisticated. This is absolutely not how progress is actually implemented, you know, in the real world and supply chains. Usually, it's on the contrary. You start with things that are impossibly convoluted, and then through superior thinking, through superior concept, through superior technology, you finally achieve simplicity. By the way, if you go back to my last lectures, uh, my last lecture on um, you know, the supply chain trends for, um, uh, for the 21st century, and you look at the concluding slides, you will see the machine of Marly, which brings water to the castle of Versailles. It's something that is of insane complications. And nowadays, we have you know, modern um, electric pumps 
that are orders of magnitude simpler to actually solve this problem much more efficiently. Um, so, uh, so, so literally, uh, this, is, this is a sort of way of thinking that we need to unwrap is that uh, progress is not to be found in extra sophistication. Extra sophistication is sometimes required, but it's not necessarily you know, an essential ingredient of progress. So uh, Alexei Tikhonov, um, large retail networks are drying their stock level um, but need to fulfill almost immediately. Sometimes they decide to make a promo on their own that has not been initiated by the supplier. What would be the approach to predict and prepare accordingly on the supplier level? So here we have to look at the problem. You know, first, um, you see, you, you, you assume that, uh, that uh, the, the, you see, uh, we have to revisit so many things. You are, you know, taking the problem from a forecasting perspective. So basically, the, the, uh, um, the, the, your client, one big retailer, is doing a big promotion uh, that, that, that comes out of the blue. First, I mean, is it such a bad thing? You know, if they promote your products, they didn't tell you about it. Well, um, um, that's just, you know, fact of life. And if you look at your history, usually um, it's not the first time that they did that. They do that on a, on a regular basis. Uh, and usually there are even patterns. You know, if I go back to my, my principles, patterns are everywhere, is that first, you need to embrace a perspective that you cannot, you know, forecast the, the, the future perspective. You need probabilistic forecasts so that, and, and even if you cannot anticipate perfectly those fluctuations, maybe those fluctuations are not entirely unexpected either. And then the thing is that maybe you need to, to change the rule of the game. Instead of, of letting the supplier surprise you uh, entirely when they do that, maybe you need to negotiate some kind of you know, commitments that binds the retailer, the retail network, and the supplier. And, and if, you know, if the, the retail network start doing a big push without giving, uh, I would say, you know, um, uh, a heads up to supplier, then the supplier cannot be, you know, realistically be held responsible for not maintaining the quality of service. So you see, it's, we need to have, maybe the solution is something that is a bit more collaborative. Maybe the solution is in the fact that the, supply, the supplier embrace, you know, has, a, a, I would say, a better risk assessment. Maybe, you know, the materials that are being sold by the supplier are not perishable. So maybe it is much more profitable to have, you know, a couple of a month of stock. People would always think of, I have zero delay, zero stock, zero everything. But are you really in the business of having zero stock? Is it really what, what your customers expect from you? Maybe what your customers expect from you as, I would say, added value to the market is to have plenty of stock. I don't know. You know, again, the answer is it depends. Um, and so you need to look at the problem from many angles, and, uh, and there, is no, um, there is no like trivial solution to this sort of problems. Um, uh, you need to think really, really hard about what is the problem, uh, what are all the options that are available to you. Maybe the problem is that maybe it's not more stock, but more production capacity, because maybe if you have like a big surge of demand, and it's not too expensive to basically have a massive spike of demand and that the suppliers of the suppliers can basically provide the materials fast enough. Maybe all you need is not higher stocks, but higher, uh, more versatile production capacity so that you can on the spot redirect your production capacity to whatever is spiking now. Um, by the way, this does exist in certain industries. For example, the packaging industries, they, um, they have massive spike capacities. You know, most of, in the packaging industry, most of the machines are just, you know, printers, industrial printers, and, and most of those printers are not printing all the time. The printers are relatively cheap. So usually people that are in the packaging business, they have tons of printers that are most of the time not used, but when there is like a big FM, a big brand that want to do a massive push, they have massive capacity to print tons of new packages that just fit the new um, marketing push of, of the brand. So, so really, really, it depends, it depends. I'm sorry to not have like a, a definitive answer, but it depends. And you, you really have, but where I can give you a definitive answer is that you have to think really, really hard about the problem that you're facing. Uh, okay, 
So I guess, I guess, um, I guess this is uh, this is everything for today. So uh, this has been, you know, the sixth uh, and the last lecture of um, of the prologue. Um, uh, two weeks from now, same day, same uh, same hour, I will be uh, I will be presenting the supply chain personnel. So see you next time.